After reading Unbroken, I now realize that I am not a man. I'm not a woman either. All I know is that I'm just inferior to Louis Zamperini. Unbroken by Laura Hillenbrand is maybe the craziest World War II book that I have ever read. The story centers around Louis Zamperini, who was a one-time uh, Olympic-level athlete who ran in the 1936 Olympics. This was, uh, of course, the Olympics that was uh, hosted by Hitler, and uh, it is also the Olympics that Jesse Owens ran in. And uh, just a couple years after his, uh, you know, his Olympic career really starts off, the Americans are pulled into the war between, uh, you know, the World War II, and Louis is now no longer pursuing the Olympics necessarily because he's flying planes over the Pacific, he's a bombardier fighting the Japanese, but then his plane gets shot down, and this is just, this is just rough, guys. I'm not spoiling anything, really. Um, I mean, I suppose I am, but these are largely known facts if you know anything about the uh, the book, but yeah, his plane gets shot down. He survives on a raft for 47 days, only to be captured by the Japanese and put into POW camp after POW camp for years. And he is tortured, and you know, eventually he makes it out. But uh, yeah, this book is absolutely freaking crazy. So if that little boiled down pitch uh, does not get you interested in this book, then you clearly are some sort of moron. Because uh, this is, without a shadow of a doubt, I'm, I kid you not, this is this is in my top five favorite books of all time, for sure. Uh, this is a life-changing, life-altering type book. Um, there's so much in here that I didn't mention, because, um, I mean, I want you guys out there, if you haven't read this book, to experience the book for yourself. It is so powerful. The book made me cry at times. It made me, um, <laughs> you know, question... Do I have that level of courage? Uh, probably not. Uh, multiple times throughout the book. And it just, uh, the book makes you appreciate whatever, it makes you appreciate life. Uh, because what well, Louis Zamperini and uh, his fellow, uh, you know, soldiers that he fought with uh, went through, um, you know, it's, it's hell. I will say though, even though this book has a whole lot of really difficult things to read, things that will make you like just feel terrible. The book has a lot of things that will lift your spirits to the point where you're crying out of joy. Uh, most of that particularly comes from the end of the book. Because um, this story, while it is a story of survival and resilience and, you know, torture, and it's also a story of redemption and forgiveness. And so uh, that, I mean, it's, it's like I said, this is one of my favorite books ever. Um, this is a book that I will reread for years to come. Uh, it's a book that I have like a running list of books that I want my children to read when they are of age, like when they're like high school years or whatever, you know, to form their moral character and shit. Um, this is one of those books that they're gonna have to read. Laura Hillenbrand did a great job of not only telling the story of Louis Zamperini and, uh, you know, the people that he interacted with, uh, both on the rafts and in, in his Olympic, uh, you know, races and in uh, the POW camps, but it also weaves together a whole lot of World War II history in such a way to where you not only are, in, are informed about what Louis went through, you're also informed about what happened during the course of World War II as a whole. And so I was really, really impressed with the structure of the book, with the just the, the overall writing of the book, and obviously the content of the book is absolutely incredible. So, I mean, like, <laughs> Before I get into the section of this uh, review where I read a couple of, uh, you know, passages from the book to further pique your interest, I will just say, if your interest is already piqued enough as it is right now, then please go to your local bookstore or wherever it is you get books and buy Unbroken and read the book immediately. But if you're still not sold on whether or not this is one of the, the most crazy books ever written, uh, please allow me to read just a couple passages from the book to illustrate the absolute insanity that Louis Zamperini and the people that he uh, was with went through. 
First of all, I would like to say the, the preface of the book really uh, sets the tone of the entire book because the preface tells the story of how when Louis was on the raft with uh, his, uh, you know, with this guy named Phil and this other guy whose last name was McNamara, uh, when they were on this, these rafts just starving to death trying to stay alive, uh, they see a plane up in the sky and they're like, yes, come here, come here, save us. You know, they've got flares, they put dye in the water to attract attention. They get the attention of the plane. And um, as it turns out, it was a Japanese plane. And instead of the Japanese plane, you know, coming rescuing them or whatever, the Japanese plane started firing at them as they were trying to survive on these little rafts in the middle of the freaking ocean. And the Japanese plane, I mean, it just comes... It's, it sets the tone of the book, because Louis has to go underneath the raft and fight off sharks. <laughs> I mean, it's, it sets the tone of the book. Um, but the first passage, uh, you know, that I want to read is a description of uh, what Louis and uh, his comrades, basically, uh, looked like and felt like as they were um, on the ocean. In the rafts. This is just a short description. It's the opening passage of chapter 14 called Thirst. It's not a spoiler really of anything. It's just something to think about if you feel sorry for yourself today. Their upper lips burned and cracked, ballooning so dramatically that they obstructed their nostrils while their lower lips bulged against their chins. Their bodies were slashed with open cracks that formed under the corrosive onslaught of salt, sun, salt, wind, and fuel residue. White caps slapped into the fissures, a sensation that Louis compared to having alcohol poured onto a wound. Sunlight glared off the ocean, sending barbs of white light into the men's pupils and leaving their heads pounding. The men's feet were cratered with quarter-sized salt sores. The rafts, bake, the rafts baked along with their occupants, emitting a bitter smell. That's what it's like to be on a raft for 47 days in the middle of the freaking ocean. To give you one example of how crazy the survival portion of the book is on the raft, I'll just tell you a couple details of just, like, think one day. Uh, so after their uh, rafts got shot up by the Japanese, amazingly, none of those three men got hit, but the raft did. And so for like the next day or so, they, as their rafts, and these were small rafts, by the way, uh, they were trying to get air back into the rafts because sharks are circling these rafts and are starting to notice that, hey, these guys are going down. And so the sharks keep on trying to get at them on the rafts. And so one of the guys is uh, stationed to uh, patch up the raft uh, while another guy is stationed to pump air into the raft, and while another guy is stationed to fight off sharks with the paddle that they have on the raft. And they do this for hours and hours and hours, just trying to stay alive. That's pretty much the, the entire portion of the book, and it's a long portion of the book, of them on the ocean in their rafts. It is the craziest thing. Louis ends up having to get in the water, like I said, when the Japanese initially strafed them. Um, and there's a part in the book where it describes him looking at his dangling sock on his foot, and then out of the darkness from underneath him, he sees a mouthful of teeth coming straight for his leg, and he has to literally hit the sharks in the nose to keep them from eating him alive. I mean, it's just absolutely crazy. So if you've had a bad day, just realize you, it probably hasn't been that bad. This passage is uh, on page 152 of at least my edition, and it says, uh, On the sixth day without water, the men recognized that they weren't going to last much longer. Mac was failing especially quickly. They bowed their heads together as Louis prayed. If God would quench their thirst, he vowed, he'd dedicate his life to him. The next day, by divine intervention or the fickle humors of the tropics, the sky broke open and rain poured down. Twice more the water ran out, twice more they prayed, and twice more the rain came. The showers gave them just enough water to last a short while longer, if only a plane would come. That's all I'll say. I'm not going to spoil uh, if you haven't read the book or whatever, uh, what happens towards the end, but that plays that little story right there of them on the rafts. Um, it plays a big role uh, in Louis's life. 
Um, by the way, the movie, just gotta stop real here, the movie Unbroken, the one directed by Angelina Jolie, uh, don't watch it. Read this book, and you don't never need to watch that movie. The movie took this book, this real pretty thick book, and compiled it into basically a montage of all the events of the book without any of the soul. So, uh, I don't like the movie. I'll just, I just have to say that. You don't get, you don't even get a fraction of the meaning and the power that this book has to offer. Now I want to read just a couple passages from uh, the uh, POW uh, situation in the Japanese internment camps. Reading about this one particular guard that they nicknamed the bird, it's so horrifying, this man. This man was so evil. And I want to read just one instance of how cruel the bird was to the POW prisoners and to uh, Louie. One day that month, Louie, Tinker, and Wade were shoveling on a barge when the foreman discovered that fish had been stolen from the galley. The foreman announced that if the thieves didn't turn themselves in, he'd report the theft to the bird. During a lunch break, the innocent men persuaded the culprits to confess. When the men walked into camp that night, the foreman told the bird anyway, as he suspected that more men had been in on the theft. The bird called for the work party to line up before him and ordered the thieves to stand before the group. He then walked down the line, pulling out Wade, Tinker, Louie, and two other officers and making them stand with the thieves. He announced that these officers were responsible for the behavior of the thieves. His punishment? Each enlisted man would punch each officer and thief in the face as hard as possible. The chosen men looked at the line of enlisted men in terror. There were some 100 of them. Any man who refused to carry out the order, the bird said, would meet the same fate as the officers and thieves. He told the guards to club any men who didn't strike the chosen men with maximum force. The, en the enlisted men had no choice. At first, they tried to hit softly, but the bird studied each blow. When a man didn't punch hard enough, the bird would begin shrieking and clubbing him, joined by the guards. Then the errant man would be forced to hit the victim repeatedly until the bird was satisfied. Louis began whispering to each man to get it over with and hit hard. Some of the British men whisper, whispered, sorry sir, before punching Wade. For the, few, for the first few punches, Louis stayed on his feet, but his legs soon began to waver and he collapsed. He pulled himself upright, but fell again with the next punch, and then the next. Eventually, he blacked out. When he came to, the bird forced the men to resume punching him, screaming, Next, next, next! In Louis's whirling mind, the voice began to sound like the tramping of feet. The sun sank, the beating went on for some two hours, the bird watching with fierce and erotic pleasure. When every enlisted man had done his punching, the bird ordered the guards to club each one twice in the head with a kendo stick. The victims had to be carried to the barracks. Louis's face was so swollen that for several days he could barely open his mouth. By Wade's estimate, each man had been punched in the face some 220 times. Enough said about the bird being a monster. In fact, the chapter where he is introduced in the book is called Monster, so there you go. And before I wrap this review up, I'd want to read one final passage uh, regarding the Japanese uh, POW camps and just how ruthless they were compared to the POW camps of Germany and others. Um, because all I'm really trying to do here with these passages is just illustrate, you know, that this book is rough but also that throughout all of this, I mean, it's an incredibly inspiring tale. And like, I mean, like I said earlier in the, in the review, I mean, the ending of this book, it's like, it, it's, it, it gets you. It made me cry, but it was like good tears and shit like that. Uh, but reading this passage, if you start crying, it's gonna be tears of sorrow, because this is some sorrowful shit. So I'm gonna read basically some statistics of what, the Japanese did in the POW camps to illustrate that, you know, this this wasn't just like, uh, you know, this wasn't Steve McQueen, the great escape type POW situation. I mean, this was 
I mean, it seems like the Japanese POW camps were the worst camps you could possibly go to. In its rampage over the East, Japan had brought atrocity and death on a scale that staggers the imagination. In the midst of it were the prisoners of war. Japan held some 132,000 POWs from America, Britain, Canada, New Zealand, Holland, and Australia. Of those, nearly 36,000 died, more than one in every four. Americans fared particularly badly. Of the 34,648 Americans held by Japan, 12,935 more, more than 37%, died. By comparison, only 1% of Americans held by the Nazis and Italians died. Japan murdered thousands of POWs on death marches and worked thousands of others to death in slavery, including some 16,000 POWs who died alongside as many as 100,000 Asian laborers forced to build the Burma Siam Railway. Thousands of other POWs were beaten, burned, stabbed, or clubbed to death, shot, beheaded, killed during medical experiments, or eaten alive in ritual acts of cannibalism. And as a result of being fed grossly inadequate and befouled food and water, thousands more died of starvation and easily preventable diseases. Of the 2,500 POWs at Borneo's Sendaken camp, only six, all escapees, made it to September 1945 alive. Left out of the numbing statistics are untold numbers of men who were captured and killed on the spot or dragged to places like Kwajalein to be murdered without the world ever learning their fate. In accordance with the Kill All Order, the Japanese massacred all 5,000 Korean captives on Tinian, all of the POWs on Balal, Wake, and Tarawa, uh, Tarawa, and all but 11 POWs at Palawan. They were evidently about to murder all the other POWs and civilian internees in their custody when the atomic bomb brought their empire crashing down. On the morning of September 2nd, 1945, Japan signed its formal surrender. The Second World War was over. Golly! A major player in cruelty during World War II that seems to be glossed over was the Japanese, and specifically their treatment of POWs and uh, laborers. I mean, it, it, it's, it's terrifying to think about. And with all this being said, I will say the book goes into detail about the good guards at these camps who went out of their way to protect prisoners and to save them from horrible beatings and to basically preserve many people alive. And the book gives great credit to those real heroes uh, in the Japanese uh, POW, uh, you know, guard regiments who, I mean, they really, it, it was, it takes, I mean, it took serious courage from reading. It took serious courage to go against the bird or other cruel commanders like him. And the ones that did uh, disobey and who did help the Australians, the Americans, uh, you know, the British and other POWs in those camps, those Japanese soldiers, uh, those Japanese guards that did the right thing, like, they ought to have statues. And I mentioned earlier in the review that this book is also a story of forgiveness. and. I don't want to spoil what happens, but I will say that uh, Louis Zamperini, like, if you, you know, there's a kind of a lack, I feel, in the modern day of, like, really great, genuine, like, male role models. Uh, Louis Zamperini, even though he's from the past, he can still be looked up to as a great ro male role model because what he did after he came home from the war and he, you know, had a horrible time readjusting to society and everything, but something happens to him that makes him do some of the most extraordinary feats of love and forgiveness that I've ever read about. And so you have that to look forward to in the book, as well as all of the stories, the crazy stories of perseverance, uh, you know, uh, resilience and redemption. Uh, you have all of that stuff to look forward to in Unbroken. So ladies and gentlemen, those are my thoughts on Unbroken. To me, it's, you know, it's an A++ uh, gift from heaven level book. Uh, so I highly recommend, obviously, that you go out and read it yourself. Uh, it will change, you know, it'll change your life. It'll change the way you live your life. It'll change the way you view your, you know, unpleasant situation, whatever unpleasant situation it is that you are living in. It, it will make you appreciate what you have, um, for sure. 
And for that reason and all the other reasons I've listed in this review, yeah, just give it a read for sure. And don't watch any of the movie representations. Uh, honestly, this thing should be made into a one season, 10 episode mini series uh, about this man's life and about the, the lives of the men around him. Because it would be an amazing story to tell, but it needs a longer format than a two hour movie. But anyways, ladies and gentlemen, if you have read Unbroken, please let me know in the comments section below what you thought of it. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, if you like this video, please like it and subscribe, tell your friends about the channel, and never forget to